Hi, I'm Rodney Rothman. I was a staff writer at Late Show with David Letterman from 1995 to 1998 and the head writer from 1998 to 2000. Fun fact, I was turned down by the Letterman internship program. Uh, two months before I was hired as a staff writer. If you were a fan of comedy, it wasn't just Dave. There were comedy writing legends that were in the room with you. People like Steve O'Donnell, Gerard Mulligan. You were like the new drummer in Judas Priest, you know, and you were, um, and you were playing for your, for your like favorite childhood band. But I'll tell you something really weird when you become a comedy writer. You pitch jokes and people go like this. If you're lucky, they go like this. That's funny. That was weird to get used to. Like, oh, we don't laugh. We, we don't laugh when we say things are funny uh, because we're thinking mathematically on like nine levels. The big piece that I would point to my first year there, Chris Farley was going to be on the show. A segment producer, Daniel Kellison and head writer, Donna Carey, they came and they asked uh, me and another writer named Steve Sherrill to come up with ideas for entrances. One of the pitches we came up with was Chris Farley comes running into the theater. He goes running up to an audience member. He picks the audience member up he carries them out of the theater onto 53rd Street. Then you cut to a pre-tape where he's carrying a dummy. He throws the dummy in a dumpster. They said, we are approving the throw the guy in the dumpster idea. You are going to be the guy that gets thrown in the dumpster. We're not using a dummy. It's just gonna be one live shot. If you look at the tape, my head comes very, very close to just smacking into a doorpost, like go straight to the hospital. Please welcome back to the program our old friend, Chris Farley. <laughs> So one of the great things about working at uh, The Late Show with David Letterman, you were one of the shows, one of the things at the center of pop culture. The sky was kind of the limit. We would do really weird things with celebrities. We did a live satellite hookup to the Beverly Hilton, I believe, where Walter Matthau would get his weekly haircut. Walter Matthau, legendary, amazing actor. We just turned on a camera while Walter Matthau got his haircut. And the pre-show meeting with Dave, when Dave, when we go over what the show was, you know, it would just be like, and we got a live, we're gonna have a live hookup to Walter Matthau getting his hair cut the whole time. And he was like, is there anything else to it than that? And I was like, nope, nope, we prepared nothing. What kind of a tipper is Walter? Well, he's a big tipper. Yeah, like, what are we talking about, a C note each time? Well, he gives me a C note, but I have to give him change, about two cents. <laughs> the, boy, the boy's got an act. <laughs> now, Louis, this is the hotel that's owned by Merv Griffin, is that correct? That is correct, now, yes. Now, uh, do you see Merv in there very often? Well, he comes in uh, for lunch, but he, he doesn't uh, get his hair cut here. He's, yeah. uh, uh, he has his own barber. Yeah, I understand. I know what you're saying, Louie. Uh, <laughs> now, I'm, I'm told that Merv Griffin is mad at me because I uh, mistakenly mentioned that he might have passed away, but he's, he's not. <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, let me tell you something. Uh, Merv Griffin gave me my start in television many, many, many years ago. And, of course, I was just kind of joking around. And uh, when you see him, uh, tell him I'm sorry I said he was dead. <laughs> okay? I remember sitting in a meeting and someone just idly said, did you ever hear the story about Art Garfunkel? He had mono when he was a kid. He spent a year at home and he passed the time by shooting free throws outside his apartment. And we said, that doesn't sound like it could be real. There's only one way to find out. Out there all night long, Art Garfunkel shooting Thank free throws. Take it away, Art. Yeah, pretty good. Take a look, see how he does. See? He's 
All right, you know, there's a uh, gentleman that works on our uh, staff who looks a little bit like you. He's our technical uh, maintenance supervisor, Gary Mintz. And, and if, if you don't mind, he's just going to come in and shoot buckets with you. Do you mind? I, I don't mind, Dave. All right, thank you very much. By the way, nice going. Gary, step thank in you. there and let's see if this likeness holds hey, Gary. up. Gary. Nice meeting you. How are you? I see it, Gary. We would get this weekly list of here are the celebrities that are in town that are available, that are up for doing comedy. And I remember this one week, Lou Rawls is available. And I remember sitting in the room with the writers, we knew anything with Lou Rawls. And then Jerry Mulligan said out loud, well, it's better to have Lou Rawls and not need him than need Lou Rawls and not have him. And then we were all silent for a while. Like it was so profound. And then we were just kind of like, I th let's just do that. <laughs> In the end, I don't believe we needed him. All right, every uh, Wednesday night uh, yeah, Dave, this Dave, summer, we'll Dave. be having... Excuse me, Dave. Yes, Alan, what can I do for you? I have something new for summer. Uh-huh, and uh, what is that? All summer long, in the green room, Lou Rawls. <laughs> wow, so Alan, why do, we have, why do we have Lou Rawls sitting in the green room? Why, you ask? Hey, say it with me, folks. Because it's better to have Lou Rawls and not need him than to need Lou Rawls and not have him. <laughs> what the hell does that mean? Yeah. Some of the, my favorite Letterman pieces that I worked on were pieces that grew over time. They became something else. We just thought it would be a good idea to have teenagers practice parallel parking. And as is often the case, someone emerged from it, this kid named Paul Fiore. This is a uh, 92 Thunderbird, huh? Mm -hmm. How many miles you got on it? Uh, 59, 173. <laughs> Maybe not math. <laughs> yeah. oh, man. We decided to kind of adopt him and his effort to get his driver's license. And then we broadcast his driving test live on the show. Again, at great expense. There was a helicopter. We made animations. We treated it like it was the Olympics. Get the, get the stern thrusters ready. We're coming ashore. Paul, on behalf of the New Jersey Division of Motor Vehicle, I'm happy to announce you passed your he test. You passed the test. <laughs> and here is the governor of the great state of New Jersey, Christine Todd Whitman. I got a little something for you that you've, a uh, little something for you here that you've earned. Congratulations. Well Thanks. done after all this. I don't know how you passed it. <laughs> Another piece that I, I really liked how it sort of went off the rails. We wanted to do a live hookup, live satellite hookup to a baggage claim uh, in Dallas. I remember getting a call 10 minutes before the show was to film saying, we're getting kicked out of the airport. We were looking in phone books and we just decided to look up luggage stores. Like what's the closest luggage store? I mean, the, the clock is ticking. You know, they got set up within seconds before the satellite hookup and we were in a random luggage store and the piece turned out great. Now, where exactly are you? What part of Dallas are you located? It's called Preston Center area. It's Northwest Highway in uh -huh. Preston Road. Kathy, Kathy, so uh -huh. right behind you is shoplifting. There's a big shoplifting. All right. <laughs> it's star time. If, if you, if you get, press the silent alarm. <laughs> Kathy? Uh-huh. Could you ask that gentleman if, if, if he's going to clean his nails to go in the back room? If you're looking for travel tips, way to make your travel easier, take a look at Al, the luggage salesman. Take a look at the length of Al's tie, you see? <laughs> <laughs> now, he did that. Al did that for a reason. Yeah. When you've when you're, when you're got a lot of bags and you're traveling, you're running through the airport, you put one bag in one hand, one in the left hand, and then you tie one to your tie. To the tie, uh-huh. So you can actually hook one up oh, around your tie. That's... And then race. Now, ladies and gentlemen, 
Salesman of the month. Texas nice style. Thank you. Got a boy. The town of Kankakee, Illinois, had been named the worst place to live in the United States. How do we at least help this town get out of the cellar? And we really talked about it. Like it was, it was like comedy writers, but then for a little bit, you're like kind of civic planners and you're really trying to think about it. Someone had the idea that maybe if we gave them a gazebo, that would be enough to just get them out of at that bottom rung. A gazebo was purchased in a Home Depot and then we gave the gazebo to the mayor of Kankakee, who I think was grateful, but was also kind of like, thanks. We were left feeling like we hadn't done enough. There was more discussion in the room about what we could do, and we went through a lot of ideas. In the end, we decided that the best thing we could do is give them another gazebo. And the thinking was, if we give them two gazebos, then they can promote themselves as Kankakee, the home of the twin gazebos. And I gotta tell you, they have never appeared again on the bottom rung of the worst places to live. So it does feel good when you can do good. Now, has anything changed since we gave you that beautiful gazebo? Oh, absolutely it's changed. The gazebo is beautiful. Uh -huh. And we really appreciated being rated in Gazebo magazine. We'd much rather have that rating than uh, be rated in the places rated Almanac. Right. It'd be like Seattle. Sure. Now, listen. Uh, all right, now. There's no need to get pissy here, Mr. Mayor. You know, we, we've been thinking about this a lot, Mr. Mayor, and we thought, well, you know, maybe we didn't do you any favors by giving you the gazebo because what you really need is some sort of tourist hook, something that will boost tourism. And we got to thinking about it, and a gazebo, I don't know, you know, we racked our brains, what can you do with a gazebo? Here's what we decided to do. You have the one gazebo, we have something else, Mr. Mayor. Hang on. Are you in a hotel there or something? I'm in a house. I'm all right. Uh, all right, well, sit down, get a hold of yourself. Okay. In addition to the gazebo, we have something else. Alan, tell them what we're giving them. Dave, we're giving them another gazebo! <laughs> Identical to the first gazebo! And crafted for mass-produced machine-made components, this gazebo will make America sit up and say, holy crap, it's just like the other one! Back to you, Dave. Now, there you go, okay, okay. Now, I know you're ahead of me on this. Do you see what we're driving at? Yes. You now have two gazebos. Here is your tourism hook. Alan, tell them about the sign. It's a sign proclaiming Kankakee as the home of the twin gazebo. <laughs> this Hollywood Pine Lake Tex Enamel Beauty will soon welcome the hordes of tourists already saying, holy crap. You often got to work with heroes of yours, you sometimes ended up in situations where you had to give performance notes to Meryl Streep, say, when you were like 23, which is weird. We once did this top 10 list. It was top 10 things that sound creepy when said by John Malkovich. And we did a fast rehearsal. And I'm gonna be honest, it was a little flat. How do I convey to John Malkovich in a nice way what we need here? And what I said to him was, it's great. It's so funny, it's great. Do you think we could try it again and you could do it a little more like you? And to his credit, John Malkovich was like, yeah. Top 10 things that sound creepy when said by John Malkovich. Number 10. Does this look infected to you? <laughs> Number nine. I put my jammies on all by myself, mommy. <laughs> wow. Oh. Number eight. You mean I get all these great funk classics on just one compact disc? <laughs> That's right. That's exactly what we mean. You know, one of the pieces that I was most proud of, we would invent fake pieces of entertainment, we would put them on the show, and we would never tell the audience that they were fake. We did a fake musical called Homecoming. It was a really long song where everybody talked about a guy named Jimmy who was coming home, and then at the end of it, Jimmy came home. I mean, it was a terrible idea for a musical. I mean, when you make something and you don't tell the audience it's a joke, and then the audience doesn't realize it's a joke, it's, ve it's very zen. It's very debatable whether you've made comedy. But it was weird when the audience filed out afterwards and you listened to them talking and they were like, that musical kind of sucked. Jimmy's coming home. I 
Jimmy's a coming home. I'm gonna make him a new pair of pants. Jimmy's coming. Jimmy's coming. Jimmy's coming. Jimmy's coming home. I'm gonna give him a piece of my mind. Jimmy's coming home. I'm gonna give him a discount on rides. Rides here. Get your rides here. The very next day, we heard that um, The Tonight Show with Jay Leno had called up the biggest musical booker in New York, livid. They had not been offered homecoming before um, we were offered homecoming. They, I thought we had a good relationship. You're supposed to tell us about these things. Now turn on my TV, homecoming's on Letterman. I've never even heard of it. They were so pissed. That was great. We did one called One Small Step. We did a stomp type group called Noise Boys. And then the culmination of everything was we invented this fake boy band called Fresh Step. There were some proper soon to be stars that were in Fresh Step. You know, we had Matthew Morrison, might have been his first job. He went on to Glee. We created this boy band. We wrote songs for them. There was always something weird about them. Like they used the name of their band Fresh Step 45 times within one song. We did a song called uh, Don't Talk to the Hand, uh, Talk to the Heart. And that was from a movie we made up starring Sarah Michelle Gellar, James Vanderbeek. We just announced all this stuff on our show like it was real, which I don't know if that's actionable or is protected by parody laws. We always said things were protected by parody laws. That's what we would just say when we did things that are probably illegal. And shortly after, we were called by MTV. MTV wanted to put Fresh Step on Total Request Live. I am joined now by uh, one of the newest guy groups to hit the scene. Ladies and gentlemen, how about a round of applause for Fresh Step? <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Carson, you got to understand that Fresh Step's all about diversification, you yeah, know? Right. Yeah. So we try to get something real cool together for everybody out there. So, you know, we got Brad, he's my man from Minnesota. We got yeah. my cousin hey, DJ here What's from up? Tallahassee. You know, three of us are from Orlando. You know, we used to work at Universal Studios and stuff. We just kind of got right. together, you know, figured, hey, man, this is easy. We could do this. That's cool. right. Pretty soon, many, 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 many tens of thousands of people around the world started to believe that Fresh Step was a real group. And we started to get a lot of emails, like thousands of emails. We got asked to tour Southeast Asia. And I have to be honest, I really wanted to do it. I was actually mentally in a place where I was like, I would like time off from being head writer of David Letterman so I can go manage. This Fresh Step thing is blowing up. I got as into that stuff as I got into anything we ever did. Our next guests are a popular new group whose uh, song is on the soundtrack for this uh, upcoming uh, movie right here, Talk to the Hand. Here they are. Please welcome back Fresh Step. Girl, read my lips, the lips of my soul. I was in a billion pieces, but you freshed me up. Fresh. You're right by my side when fresh comes to shove. You got it going on Like my main man above Up in heaven I'm in heaven I'm in heaven Talk to the hand Talk to the heart We're only fresh together We can't fresh apart Girl, you're freaky fresher Than a fresh work of art Don't talk to the hand Just talk to my heart. There you go, fresh step. Thank you, boys. Thank you, nice job. You know, a short list of people who yelled at me, Geraldo yelled at me. Um, he told me I just didn't get it. We just weren't tapped into the stuff that Geraldo was tapped into on a comedy level. <laughs> <laughs> I know everything. <laughs> <laughs>